I'm going to be doing stuff for the rest of my life at Gateway Church. And basically until the elders come to me and say, Pastor Robert, uh, you're starting to say that there are 12 commandments and there are 10 and that there are 10 disciples and there are 12. Now, it, you're thinking, where is it? Because I can't remember. <laughs> it's in your subconscious. Have you ever said, oh, what's, what's her name? It's, it's on the tip of my tongue. It's not on the tip of your tongue. It's, a, it's expression. It's in your subconscious. And you're try, it's there because it'll come to you a lot of times right before you go to sleep. Cindy, you know, it just comes out. Here is a clip and then we'll dive into uh, everything else that we have today. Okay, here we go. Does that yeah. relationship well, need to change into? Yeah, it changes because um, 12 and under, uh, according to the Bible and according to even um, psychologists, child psychologists, mm -hmm. 12 and under is a child. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, we have, they like to say preteen, but 12 and under, 13 to 19. So anything that ends with a teen is an adolescent mm -hmm. and 20 and above is an adult. And that's basically the way it's defined mm -hmm. um, secularly, but it comes from scripture. I, I could give you the scripture on all of those. Okay. All right. So, 12 and under, we're telling them what to do. Nine, uh, 13 to 19, we're teaching them how to learn what to do. Mm. Mm. And then over 20, we're trusting them. Mm. So there's a, a telling, and then there's a teaching for them to learn how to make decisions, good decisions, mm. and then there's a trusting. And so, like when you guys became adults, it was a trust. Mm -hmm. But in the same way that I trust my friend, who's maybe my same age, I might say to him, hey, as a brother in Christ, I have a, I want to share something yeah. with you that I feel like you could be going down the wrong road. Mm. And so I would still do that, but it has to be different. It can't come across as dad is telling me mm. not to do this anymore mm -hmm. because I think then it can actually create a wedge yeah. between adult sons and daughters and parents. That's yeah, so no, good. that's fantastic. And I know uh, there may be some parents. Okay, so that is Robert Morris. Uh, he was speaking to his, oh, speaking to his son. Okay, so clearly he is giving us a testimony that 12 and under, this is, you, you tell them what to do, right? This is a child. And now you find yourself in the situation whereby you did uh, the despicable things to Cindy, who was 12 at the time. Okay, so clearly it's not that Robert did not know that Cindy was 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 a child was young okay but he proceeded to do those things so now you're telling your son that okay 12 and the and i mean i'm telling you man i'm not a lawyer but if you're to go to court you just okay we're gonna play this clip like oh uh mr roberts <laughs> do you believe a 12 year old is a child yes or no please <laughs> so all that is is gonna go down so i don't think that he'd even want to go uh to that level okay so this is a situation just like wow and beknownst to you you were actually doing things that actually just implicated um yourself so as you know last sunday was i guess this was the first time uh, people had to go to church the church was empty so take a look at this picture all right so as you can see this picture I mean, is as empty as whatever, you know, this was uh, their church over there being, you know, quite empty, obviously. I'm sure, you know, some people didn't want to go to church for whatever the reason, which you can definitely understand, right? At that point, who else wants to go to church, you know? Like, I'm sure they knew that everybody will be uh, looking for them. So, this Robert Morris wasn't done. Take a listen to this clip, okay? If, if you don't hear it, it's just a short clip. I don't have any problem replaying it to you guys, okay? So this is Robert Morris teaching uh, his congregation. As you know, he's always been open that, quote-unquote, uh, when he was young, he had a relationship with a young lady. So listen to what he said in this, uh, in this clip, okay? Let me put, I have to put said and everything. Your mind has logged everything you've ever done everything you've ever said and everything that's ever been said to you and everything you've ever seen or experienced. Your mind has it. Now, it, you're thinking, where is it? Because I can't remember. <laughs> it's in your subconscious. Have you ever said, oh, what's, what's her name? It's, it's on the tip of my tongue. 
It's not on the tip of your tongue. It's, a, it's an expression. It's in your subconscious. And you're try, it's there because it'll come to you a lot of times right before you go to sleep. Cindy, you know, it just comes out. Robert Morris is the founder and senior pastor at Gateway Church in South Lake. A woman has come forward. Cindy Clemeshire, the accuser, she says that the abuse first happened on Christmas Day in 1982. She was just 12 years old. She says that abuse continued until she was 16 years old. Your mind has logged everything you've ever done everything you've ever said and everything that's ever been said to you and everything you've ever seen or experienced. Your mind has it. Now, it, you're thinking, where is it? Because I can't remember. <laughs> it's in your subconscious. Have you ever said, oh, what's, what's her name? It's, it's on the tip of my tongue. It's not on the tip of your tongue. It's an it's expression. It's in your subconscious. And you're try it's there because it'll come to you a lot of times right before you go to sleep. Cindy, you know, it just comes out. Robert Morris is the founder. There you have it, guys. This guy was just outing himself, okay? Like, what is the coincidence that you can be giving this example in church to your congregation and the example that you use is uh, the name Cindy? You see what I'm saying? So, to me, I think there was some guilty conscience that was hunting uh, Robert Morris, to, for me, is what I can see. Because this is, I, I, I find it hard to believe that is a coincidence. Okay? I find it hard to believe that is a coincidence. So, there, um, this clip was eight years ago. So, eight years ago, because, like, you know, everybody knew that he used to talk about that, right? But people just didn't know what it was. Can you imagine uh, if, if Cindy hearing this? You know, and like, oh, if you've done things, it's, you know, subconscious things of that nature. I was just like, man, this guy, he's up to no good. There is, uh, there's this clip over here, okay? I'll play it and then I'll, you know, I'll skip play and skip it because it's, it's some, um, what's his name? I need to give the credit to the person. I'll look at the name and then give them the credit. But they did, uh, they did a good job just to cut this video. He did a very good job. All right, so let's continue, okay? Thank you guys for being here. Here we go. I and holy calling. There to be shepherds of the sheep that Christ paid for with his own blood. There to preach Christ and him crucified. But rather than preaching Christ, these celebrity megachurch pastors, men like Robert Morris, have fleeced the flock for years. Some, as in the case of Morris, have even physically and emotionally damaged those they were supposed to be protecting. And yet, sadly, these pastors protect one another. When one of these men fall into heinous sin, rather than rallying around the victim or victims that have been abused, they rally around the abuser, put him through a few unbiblical steps of what they call restoration. And within just a year or two, that abusive pastor is right back in the pulpit. This has to stop. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the crises a uh, senior pastor might find himself in, and you each may have an experience with this, is a leader who has fallen. Um, what would you say to the church of, of how we should respond to, to leaders who have fallen, and how should we restore leaders who have fallen? What would, you, what would your insight and comment be into that? With a spirit of gentleness, considering ourselves, lest we also be tempted. <laughs> right? Galatians 6.1. Go ahead. No, that's, um, I don't think there's a set way for every situation. I think every situation presents um, a different response, and of course, their response to the whole process dictates a lot of that. My only observation on restoration of leaders that I can say, like, so I went through, I, w I went through one, helped, helped someone through one, and in preparation for it, actually studied over 2,000 cases to find out what worked and what didn't. And, um, and the, the one common denominator in the ones that weren't working is that there was no clear path. So, so that people who go through that, there's a, such a sense of hopelessness because they, they're right in the middle of losing everything that if you don't show here's the way out and, and make the steps clear, they get so despondent, they get really, they make some very, they make even worse decisions and their attitude gets bagged and they'll flip the whole thing and turn into the, and make you, you know, make themselves the victim. And it's crazy how many times that has happened. So the hello everyone. Welcome along for truth. So far, everything that I've seen, whatever I've heard is sound. So I appreciate that. So credit goes to longing for truth. So as you can see, this Robert Morris, apparently when these churches want to have, uh, what do you call, if the church wants people to be tithing, they want the church to be tithing, they want people to be restored and everything, 
uh, Robert Morris is their guy. This is the guy that they used to call. You know what I mean? Like, the who is who. I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, looks like he was a respected guy in, in these people's community. In the community. <laughs> So, like, you know, he was the man, okay? He was the man. It's Robert Morris. Like, he's the man. So, there you have it, like, uh, uh, that's him. So, just like, okay, you know, on these guys and everything. If somebody fall, restore them with a gentle of uh, spiritness, right? So, I guess at the back of his mind, he knew, like, okay, one day, this could be me. I might as well prepare, lay the ground, right? Lay the ground. But, hey, so far, Driscoll's been radio silent okay <laughs> so uh let's um watch some more okay here we go i love theology there are many many scriptures that i don't have revelation of and uh people here's the amazing thing is people will try to figure them out and they'll come up with some unbelievable thing you, you can't figure the bible out god has to reveal it to you so this scripture right here i could never figure out one thing here's what it said Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And that's Jesus talking. Okay, here's what I couldn't figure out. You mean Satan can take the word out of my heart? And that scared me. Thy word have I hidden in my heart. Hidden. <laughs> so that I might not sin against you. So I've got Jesus saying that Satan can take the word out of my heart. So how can he take the word out of my heart? So this week I'm studying and praying. I come to the scripture. And I said, Lord, you know, it's been years. And I've never understood that scripture. And it was like, okay. And he gave it to me, just like that. So how can Satan take the word out of your heart? Okay, remember God speaks and Satan speaks. And we can speak. And we, can, we either agree, all of our words either agree with God's word or Satan's words. Okay. But when you speak, guess from where you speak? <laughs> from the abundance of of the heart, the mouth speaks. So God sows the word. Someone speaks the word, preaches the word, teaches the word, you read the word, and the word is sown in your heart. Satan, what he does is immediately tries to get you to speak something in opposition of the word you just heard, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and when you speak it out, it leaves your heart. That's the problem. So when God speaks something to me, I have to immediately hide it in my heart. I have to meditate on it. I have to memorize it. I have to hold on to it. I have to ponder it like Mary did when the angel came to her. I have to hold on to that word, hold fast to the word that you've received. Amen. Otherwise, Satan will come and try to get me to speak something that disagrees with what God told me. And when I speak, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and the word can leave. Are y'all following me? And the word leaves my heart because I'm the one that spoke it out. Um, this is how he was able to to con people okay this guy sounds so convincing and did you see the people in the audience they'll be like oh wow this guy is dropping in some jewels over here you see what i'm saying like no we already know right this is idea like according to him god speaks to him and then he's going to hide the word in his heart did you see he didn't even reference to the scriptures yes god speaks through his word that's how God speaks. It's through his word. But he's trying to make it that he is receiving special revelation. Okay? He's receiving special revelation. Nobody else is receiving it but him. So as a result, obviously, you're going to attract people, right? Because, you know, God is speaking to you exclusively. He's not doing that with anybody else but you. So this is a common tactic that these people use, okay? Like every time they use a tactic like this so they can, you know, um, conjure up things that are simply not there, but, you know, people are going to get hooked, right? Like, oh, okay, you know, God is speaking to this. And then he even, he went on to actually uh, just declare himself as an apostle. <laughs> Guys, but whatever these people are doing, <laughs> it's unbelievable. You'll be like, wait a minute. Did he actually say that? No, he didn't. Oh, yes, he did. Okay. So we have that for you guys. Okay. But uh, uh, let's watch some more and then we'll continue. Okay, well, how does that relate to the tithe? Now, listen to me carefully because I'm going to say something very strong. Any person that doesn't tithe is arrogant. Amen. Because you believe you can make it your way and not doing it God's way. And you have to be arrogant to steal from God. Amen. You have to be extremely arrogant to steal from God. And please understand, if you don't tithe, that's an open door to demons. Amen. Because that's exactly what the enemy does. He's a thief. And you're allowing God 
You're, I mean, you're allowing Satan to get you to, to be a thief, but not only a thief, but stealing from God. And I don't say that to make you feel condemned or to argue about tithing. I'm telling you, that's, a, that's an open door. And no matter how many doors you close in your life, if you're not a tither, you've always got an open door to the enemy. And this is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. He stole two things. He stole the tithe and he stole the next generation. Okay, so obviously, like I told you, this is the guy that they call when it comes to tithing. Okay, like, okay, they'll call out Morris and then he's going to tell you. And then he just said, like, okay, if you're not tithing, you're opening doors for, uh, for demons. Well, he might, as, he might as well join the demon slayer squad. Like, why are you guilting people to give? The scripture is clear. God loves the cheerful giver. It's the scripture is clear. Like, okay, we know, right? We, uh, in order for the ministry to go forth, we need to sow into the ministry, right? But you're not going to be... Uh, you, this, these are not the tactics. These are not biblical tactics, okay? Whatever he's saying is unbiblical. If people want to give, let them give freely, right? Like you give freely, you have received freely, you're going to give, right? God loves a cheerful giver. No, but he wants to create uh, an environment where these people are going to feel guilty about, uh, about giving, Okay, and this is, you know, Jamal is, is big on this as well, you know, just making people feel guilty about, uh, about giving. So another person who is not even having it right now with what has uh, transpired is uh, Rick Warren. Okay, so I uh, mean, should I be agreeing with <laughs> Rick Warren right now? Okay, but this is the tweet that Rick Warren put out. Okay, we'll read it and then we'll continue with the video. Welcome, guys. Here we go. All right. So this is uh, Rick Warren, okay? And this is what uh, he put, okay? I am angry and disgusted to hear of Robert Morris' abuse of a child and heartbroken for seeing the cremation. To use a 12-year-old child then continued for years is not merely an inappropriate relationship, quote-unquote inappropriate relationship. It's a crime. S. Child abuse is an evil punishable by law. One can't, one can't just confess when caught and move on with no consequences. For the integrity of Christ's body, God insists, expel the wicked person out of your church. Hey, hey, Rick Warren quoting scripture over here. Yes and amen. Perpetrators are to be publicly fired, not allowed to resign. Child abuse still enrages Jesus. If anyone offends one of these little ones, it would be better for him to have a millstone hung around his neck and drowned in the sea. Matthew 18 verse 6, until the church realizes the soul-destroying trauma of S abuse, the pattern will continue. K still remembers the horror of being uh, M in a church as a little girl, Proverbs 31, 8. So Kay, that's um, Rick Warren's wife. So Rick Warren actually just had, you know, actually put a picture right here. This is a millstone. Quoting the scripture, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it will be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Matthew 18, verse 6. So even Jesus pronounces what you call a death sentence as a punishment. But we have arrived. We are so holy. We're just going to put you out there in a penitentiary where the people you abused are going to be uh, making sure that you're getting three meals a day for the rest of your life. Help me out here. Help me out here. So this is, uh, I was just like, wow, you know. So Rick Warren uh, came out and just be like, no, 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 no. We're not playing games out here, okay? We're not playing games out here. So this guy, uh, Robert Morris, he had a grandy, he had, he, had a, he had big plans, okay? He had big plans. He wasn't planning of uh, exiting the pulpit anytime soon, okay? And he telegraphed how all that was going to uh, unfold the years at, you know, at his church. So... Let's hear him in his own words, the plans that he had, okay? Tenure again in the pulpit, almost the same that I'm doing for quite a few years, and then for the rest of my life. Again, I'm going to be, I'm going to be doing stuff for the rest of my life at Gateway Church. And basically, until the elders come to me and say, Pastor Robert, uh, you're starting to say that there are 12 commandments and there are 10, and that there are 10 disciples and there are 12 
it's time for the rocking chairs, okay? All right, but, but I'm, I'm here. We're not going anywhere. You'll be hearing me preach. The television ministry will continue. The radio ministry will continue, but I'll be here, okay? I'll become, in two and a half years, when I pass the senior pastorship to this person, I'll become the apostolic, the senior apostolic elder, the lead apostolic elder. So I will still at any time be able to come into the eldership and say, I want to share some things at any time. And I've earned the right to do that. And God's given me. Now, I, and I, I, you know what? I shouldn't say that. I haven't earned the right to do it. God's given me that position. God called me to be the senior pastor. No man called me to do this. God did. So, so uh, we're going to make... Yes. So right now, Robert Morris is no longer a senior pastor. Robert Morris is no longer uh he's no longer at uh Gateway Church. According to him, right? God is the one who gave him that position and he's going to hold that position until the day pretty much he dies, right? Until where he cannot, you know, like his mind has left him. So right now, Robert Morris is no longer a pastor. So only two things can be correct over here. Okay, according to him, that's what God gave it to him. So if right now, Robert Morris is no longer a pastor over there, either God lied about it, and we know God is not a man that he should lie, or Robert Morris lied about it because he's no longer a pastor. Because the promises of God are irrevocable. Okay, they are yes and amen. If God promises he will fulfill it and it shall come to pass. And nobody can stay, um, can stay his hand. So what, where is Robert Morris now? And then he even caught himself, right? He says like he's earned it. And when I pass on this uh, ministry, like he, no wonder you treated this church like you own it, it's your business. You did everything the way you wanted to, compromising the word of God. This is what happens when people who are not supposed to be mounting the pulpit are mounting the pulpit because they own the place. So, you know, yes, right now he's out, but, you know, he, he just handed the keys, right, to the future uh, James Morris uh, in, in together with his wife. That's it. And all the elders are just going to follow suit, right? And then we will have, uh, you know, Tony Evans is coming up shortly. But you see, the, the precedence, the pattern, that's, that has been set forth in these so-called churches. For being here, and we welcome guys who are joining uh, on the replay. All right, so here is a, a short clip just to keep everybody uh, up to speed, okay? Here we go. Devastated and grieving. That is how a Gateway Church elder reacted this weekend to the accusations that the church founder allegedly sexually assaulted a child decades ago. The church has now hired a new law firm. They're investigating what happened all those years ago. And our Andrea Lucia showing us how Morris's own words may be coming back to haunt him. And what's sleeping tonight? As protesters gathered outside. I did not know the truth. Gateway Church this weekend directly addressed Cindy Clemeshire, the woman who says she was sexually abused by its founder as a child. And I want to say to you, Cindy, I'm so sorry. Robert Morris, who admitted to, in his words, an inappropriate sexual relationship with a young lady, has now lost his position as senior pastor at the church and had his programming pulled from Daystar Television. I've seen fallen leaders restored many, many, many times. It, can, it really can be done. Um, I've In a 2017 interview, he addressed the importance of honesty. If you start covering up again, because he's been covering up for however many years we're involved in this, if you start covering up again, that's when, that's when everything stops. It all shuts down. So that's the biggest thing you have to worry with. But Morris's own accounts of his past failures are now in question. Church elders say Morris disclosed to them he'd had an extramarital affair, not that he'd abused a 12-year-old. Morris and the church have also claimed he underwent a two-year restoration process that included him stepping out of the ministry during that period. 
In his book, From Dream to Destiny, he wrote, The Lord orchestrated the circumstances for me to step out of the ministry in order to humble his growing pride. But that after a month of working nights as a security guard at Motel 6, he took a job as morning supervisor at a ministry prayer center. Partially redacted emails released by Clemeshire's attorney show nearly two decades later in 2005, she reached out to Morris, writing, you have had almost no consequences for your actions. I have suffered almost my entire life from the emotional damage you inflicted on me. I want some type of restitution. In response, an email from what appears to be Morris's account reads, If you desire to make this public, I am also willing to do so. But it warns, my attorney advises that if I pay you any money under threat of exposure, you could be criminally prosecuted. And Debbie and I do not want that. The Debbie that Morris is referring to there is his wife of more than 40 years. The two were married at the time of the alleged abuse, and their son, James, is the associate senior pastor here at Gateway. In fact, James was chosen as his father's successor last year, and according to Gateway's website, he is now the only one in a position of senior leadership at the church. Yes, so as you can see, they are keeping everything in the family, in the family. So, yeah, what else, uh, what else do you expect with this guy, right? He's just handed the keys over to his son, who is now going to be, I mean, on the website, he's registered as a senior pastor right now. He's, uh, he's the one who's registered uh, as a senior pastor right now. So, we uh, thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Don't forget to hit the likes. I appreciate you guys for being here. I mean, the story is so infuriating where all these things uh, uh, keep coming up, keep coming up, keep coming up, right? And I think at this point, I'm sure his attorneys have definitely, without no doubt, advised him, like, you know what? You better keep quiet. <laughs> you better keep quiet. Because, I mean, like, hey, man, if he says anything, my understanding, the statute of limitation has passed and other people were saying the only thing that he can do is, um, uh, what do they say, civil court or something to that effect. But I don't know, you know, because so far she hasn't said anything that she's going to sue uh, anything to that nature. But at this point, there's just too much information that has come out that will just lend uh, him... He is in trouble, okay? He is definitely in trouble. There's just no two ways about it. No two ways about it is what I'm seeing right about now, okay? Gateway Church, okay? This is where Robert Morris is a senior pastor. They have issued a statement of an apology, and they did this uh, in the congregation, okay? Apologizing to the congregation. But it wasn't Robert Morris who was apologizing. It was one of the elders who apologized. So here is the video of how this apology went on, okay? My name is Trey Wilbanks, and I'm here to speak to you on behalf of the Gateway Elders. I really wish that I could sit down with each one of you individually and talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Standing before you right now may be the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. So I ask for your grace as I speak to you today, because I'm going to speak to you personally, as a father, as a husband, and a non-staff elder since 2014. I'm going to try to speak to you from my heart today, so I wrote my thoughts down to make sure I say exactly what I want to say. My wife, Shelly, and I have seven children, including six girls. As a father, what has happened is extremely disturbing. And I'm experiencing a wide range of emotions like you. As an elder, I did not know the truth. And frankly, like so many of you, my wife and I are shocked, devastated, and grieving. Firstly, I'd like to express my 
personal compassion for Cindy Clemenshire. Okay, so they, according to the elders, they, they didn't know that Cindy Clemenshire was 12 years old. But they were aware that Robert had a past because Robert shared this much, uh, shared as much with the congregation. I think he even wrote it in a book. So, but there is, um, I don't know, you can make your own judgment. If you want to believe the elders that they didn't know or you want to believe that they knew about something else, okay? Because people are on both sides of this equation. But let's continue to hear what the elder had to say. I can't imagine carrying a burden like that for so many years. And I want to say to you, Cindy, I'm so sorry. I'm also very sensitive to anyone else in this room or anyone who is listening who's experienced abuse. I know that there are many in this room, at our other campuses, and many watching online who have their own horrific abuse story. And I want to speak to you. I'm so sorry. I'm just so sorry. I cannot imagine the pain and the emotions that this past week has stirred inside of you as you felt betrayed. And on behalf of the elders, we're sorry. This past week, the Board of Elders accepted the resignation of our senior pastor, Robert Morris. Our tagline at Gateway Church is, we're all about people. And you can't be all about people if you aren't committed to protecting people. We are committed to protecting people. First and foremost, children and the most vulnerable. Simply put, abuse in any form cannot be tolerated. And we as elders have the responsibility to do whatever it takes to learn the truth. And I want you to know that as your elders, we are deeply committed to walking in integrity and finding the truth. We moved quickly this week to hire an independent outside law firm to conduct a comprehensive and independent inquiry into this entire situation. The elders and you must know the facts and we must enforce accountability. <laughs> Having this review completed by an independent outside organization is critical and we will report back to you once their work is complete. And please know that the Board of Elders is fully cooperating with this independent work which has already begun. And I ask that we all be patient while we give them time to do their work. Now I want to get very personal and I apologize if I get emotional. As I said before, I'm a father of six girls and this has been a difficult thing to explain to them this past week. And our family this past week, like all of you, has shed tears, had heavy conversations, and we've been in deep prayer. We've prayed for Cindy Clemenshire. We prayed for her family. We've prayed for the entire Morris family. We're praying for you. And we're praying for our staff and our whole church family. Our family has been going to Gateway Church for 18 years. We go to Gateway Church not because of a building or a person. Our family goes to this church because we've seen the Lord move here. Our family goes here because we're inspired by you and the work that you do to those who are in need and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our family goes here because of the deep relationships that we've formed with close friends who help us grow closer to Christ. Our kids met Jesus here. Some of our kids have been baptized here. All of our kids have been transformed by the student's ministry. I'm aware that many in this room have seen their marriages saved because of the healing power of Jesus showing up in our marriage ministry. Many in this room have overcome depression and iniquity because of Kairos. And many of us have made it through unthinkable and painful circumstances because of our grief ministry. <laughs> so
So what about the future of our church? Frankly, this past week, I've just been trying to get through each day. And there are a lot of unknowns. The truth is, I don't know what God's plans are. But I know that I'm going to continue to worship the Lord. And I'm going to worship the Lord in this place. Jesus said, I will build my church. I want to remind you, this is his church. This is Jesus' church. And the elders are humbly and firmly submitted to what he wants to do with this church. I believe the Lord built Gateway Church. And I believe that the Lord worked through all of you to build Gateway Church. He worked through our altar ministry. He worked through our marriage ministry. He worked through our children's workers. He's worked through our prophetic ministry. He's worked through our parking attendants. He's worked through our greeters. He's worked through the staff and all of the volunteers at Gateway Church. So my encouragement to you today is to take these upcoming days, weeks, months, and turn your hearts to our Lord and Savior. Let us remember Jesus' specific commands, that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, all of our strength, and that we love others. This is our important responsibility, to follow the Lord Jesus regardless of the season, mountain or desert. And I believe he will lead us together through this. I'm clinging to the word of God right now. His word is a lamp unto my feet. He will never leave us or forsake us. He is near to the brokenhearted and saves those crushed in spirit. And he's set enthroned in the flood. We're praying for you all. We love you. We appreciate you and we're thankful that you're here today. So that was uh, an elder at Gateway Church reaching out to the congregation. So they did this on a Saturday, okay? So what we've watched over here is what took place on a Saturday, okay? But when it came to Sunday, the place was empty, okay? The place was empty, and this is how, uh, this was the Sunday service, okay? So Sunday looked like this, but on Saturday, it was definitely packed. I assume that people wanted to hear as to, what exactly, you know, what are they going to say, right? They needed to hear. So there was uh, some protesters who were protesting outside the church. Apparently, these people have had that particular ministry outside. I'm going to play this video for you guys. I was trying to understand what they are saying. What I was hearing, okay, if I'm correct, that there was another incident at Gateway Church before something to involving somebody else. So I'll let you guys listen to it. That way, you know, I don't have to um, say something that is incorrect. So you guys, you can tell me in the chats, okay? I'm instructed not. Can I, can I get you? Yes. Can you talk? Do you, do you yes. mind talking? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, this is my mom. Yes, we go to, our members of Action Gateway Frisco, we have a ministry outside um, where we educate parents and children in the community about child sex trafficking and arrested and charged two months later and waiting for trial. yes Wait. but they and they intentionally did not they were instructed not to tell anybody it was only until we kept giving them time thinking but so they would do the th right they thing. would do the right thing because right. the group that we right. were in with him it was families and it was very young children in the case that they were all and it's not our position 
our decision to, right. to, to say if they want to know or not know, right. guilty or not, right. and, you know, and, and you tell you what, what, what you want with that information, but it's not, that's it, their family. Give parents the information to do with right. that what they want to, they, to yeah, protect they, their families. They yeah. right to that, yeah. and they can decide. Uh, right. We don't withhold that from them. Uh, needless to say, those those parents were very happy that we, you know, oh, they do relief. whatever yeah. they want to do without that information. Okay, so... It was very difficult for me to make up what they were saying. My understanding was there was another incident that took place at um, at the same church. And they tried to help. You know, I don't know. I just played that for you guys. So I don't want to make so much a comment because I wasn't... It wasn't making sense to me. If it made sense for you guys, then... Uh, that's it. You know what I mean? Because my conclusion was they were saying there was another incident there that involved another child. You know? So I don't know with if what I was hearing was correct. So uh, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. I'll look in the chat, you guys, if you've made a, if you were able to ascertain what that was all about. Okay.